Your application requires a higher SLA. We're definitely looking into a couple of things. One is availability zones. The second one is multi-region support. If we go back to our diagram, one of the things that we can do here, and we do have that implemented as an example in this reference architecture, is that in a uh, node pool, so take the user node pool, for example, uh, we have the use of various availability zones. In our use case here, and I'll just draw here for um, simplicity, this workload at the bottom here, this one, this is running not only in a virtual machine scale set, VMSS, but it's also in Kubernetes terms, we're deploying this in a node pool. So this node pool here, and as we've discussed before, um, you wanna have multiple nodes in a node pool, if that's not enough for your application, what we're looking into now is then to have the different nodes placed into availability uh, zones. So let's suppose this here is availability zone one, and then do a little dot line in here, and then you're gonna have the second one in the availability zone number two, and so forth and so on. So even in the event of an entire availability zone going down, an outage, uh, you'd have your resources running in a separate um, availability zone. Now, this only works if the region you are um, deploying your workloads actually support availability zones. Not every one of them do today. Uh, we're always moving into increasing that, but do make sure that you're checking of the limitations that you have in that region. You also want to make sure that because we're using a VM skill set, that the SKU used for those VMs, in my case here, DS4 V2, um, are available in every one of the availability zones within the region that you are using. Now, there are a few things to consider here when we're doing um, this availability zones. One of which is this, you can you can definitely go and try to protect the entire infrastructure. That might not be possible in some use cases, but you should probably try to aim for that. Um, do go and choose a region for the deployment. Uh, again, this will be based on, on business decisions, uh, whether that's proximity to your customers um, or uh, regulatory obligations. So if you, what you wanna do is look at the matrix of, this is what the business want, that's what I have. And what I have here is a region that do support availability zone. Maybe not exactly in the skill that we were initially thinking, but um, you know, changing the skill a little bit would actually accommodate for our SLA. So have that in mind. Now, in terms of the cluster and protecting the cluster, uh, we can make sure that the node pools are spread out between different availability zones. Again, in our example here for this architecture, we actually have three availability zones, uh, one, two, and three, where each one of the nodes in the user node pool is deployed in a separate um, availability zone. That's not true for the um, AKS API server that runs in a single um, availability zone. And if for some reason the AKS API server goes down, uh, the only thing that you lose here is just the orchestration back into your cluster. It won't affect your workloads. It might affect at, at times, um, but it just loses the orchestration capability. Dependent resources is also something we want to take a look. For a complete zonal benefit, what we're looking into is that all the services and dependencies, so think about in our use case here, the Azure Firewall, uh, the Azure Container Registry, that those uh, services also do support availability zone within the region that you are deploying. Now, it's important to notice that um, not every service will support that, so you might have to uh, change and get a different service for this. For instance, in our use case here, when we're, we're looking into um, having these different nodes uh, deployed, we can also take a benefit here of having, um, for instance, Azure Container Registry, 
being paired into a different region. And that brings me into the next topic here. If zones on their own, they're not enough, or you wanna extend um, your SLA even further, what you could do is take a look at multiple regions. With multiple regions, our recommendation would be to use paired regions. The example here is the Azure Container Registry again. Um, as the cluster itself tries to fetch images from a specific ACR, if that ACR for some reason is down, the cluster can uh, follow up with a second uh, copy of that in a paired region. Once we have paired regions, uh, the ACR will copy the images from region one for the primary region to the secondary region. You can also enable um, other things such as the use of the Flux um, CD for your continuous uh, deployment back to your cluster so that if, a, if an entire region is actually down, um, cluster CD can pick this up from a different region. You can configure that and that could help you with a uh, disaster recovery strategy as well. Another level that you might want to look into this, so not only we're looking at deployment um, and also the services, again, like ACR, but what happened if um, I want to now guarantee that my web traffic uh, does not go down if one of the regions is down? An approach here, the approach we've taken for this architecture is just to use an internal load balancer with an application gateway. An application gateway is a region-based resource. If you want to extend this, what we're looking into is to use something like Azure, Azure Front Door. So with Front Door, um, you can then send traffic to various regions. So let's say I have a region here, number two, with my AKS and all the resources in there. Uh, Front Door is a global resource, so you can use that. You can also use Traffic Manager in combination of the application gateways and the other components we have. But Front Door will give you a lot of the things that an application gateway will give in a single region, but now looking at a global scale. The other thing that I want to bring it up, in our use case here, um, we our workload is non-stateful. By that I mean we really don't have, a, uh, we're not persisting data anywhere, there's no database. But if you do need to persist data, the recommendation is really not to have that in the cluster. So not running the database in the cluster, just put that outside. If there's a, there's a reason why you do have to run this in the cluster, we recommend that you back up that data frequently. Now, we, a lot of our first party services will offer um, SLA and will be geo-distributed. So if you think about Cosmos DB, for instance, that will be an option if you have to scale this for more than one data center and then you can write to, to Cosmos as your backend database. The Kubernetes API server uptime um, is one that we need to take a look as well. You can and we do recommend that whenever you run a cluster in production, um, that you, you go and there is a way for you to obtain an SLA. Now to obtain that uptime SLA, um, it's a purchase you make. We certainly recommend that for production. Reserve clusters without this option just for pre-production clusters or development uh, that you really don't need to pay for that SLA. And when you have Azure availability zones and the Kubernetes API server SLA uh, is increased to 99.95%, Nodes and, and you know node pools, they are covered by a separate and they have their own SLA. The last topic here is there's a trade-off, as it is with everything. There's a trade-off when you go and you do these changes. So on one side, the business wants you to guarantee an SLA, that SLA has been agreed with your customers. Um, cost is typically the number one trade-off when you're looking into things like Geo replication and disaster recovery strategies. Now, for you to be able to manage this, um, you could also take a look at other things like reserved instances. The last topic here would be testing with simulations and force failovers. Uh, by that I mean, go back to your cluster and let's say uh, shut down one of these nodes or uh, remove 
access or just change the credential, let's say, to one of the ACR regions and see what happens. Can a failover take place? Uh, trigger some of these changes in your DevOps pipeline. What does it happen? Can my application sustain this? Um, what happens if I take an entire cluster down? Can I? How, how long does it take for us as a team to come back online? So again, something like Flux CD and GitOps are uh, tools that you can use and that are at your disposal for, for this type of situations.